Good evening, everyone. Uh, truly uh, wonderful to be able to see folks and have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be a great, too bad it's virtual, but a great event. Uh, my name is Al Konetsny, and I'm the co-chairman of tonight's gala event with uh, Denise Krepp. Uh, truly delighted to, to welcome everybody this evening. And certainly, I think it's a momentous occasion where so many various constituents of our maritime community are gathered virtually to pay homage to three truly iconic American maritime institutions. More about that later. Obviously, in this uh, you know unusual time in our history, it's more important than ever that the entire gambit of the maritime community, as we know it, convene in this tribute. You know, we all believe that the tide rises for us all and brings the heritage and today's maritime community together for a stronger future for all of us. So on behalf of everyone involved here, we welcome you. And I would make a promise, and I hope the heck we can make it, I think we will, that next year, that we all hope to shake your hand as you enter the National Press Club for our in-person event. It'll happen. We've got to be positive. With that all said, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to introduce tonight's master of ceremonies, a world-class sailor, a world-class television commentator, author of 21 sailing books, an editor of Sailing World and Cruising World magazines, on the winning team of America's Cup, recently retired as vice president of the International Sailing Federation, was past president of U.S. Sailing, a previous recipient of our own Distinguished Service Award here, America's Ambassador of Sailing. It gives me just great, great pleasure and a real honor to introduce Mr. Gary Gobson. So Gary, I'm gonna turn it over to you, fine, sir. All right, Admiral Konetsky, thank you very much. And uh, by the way, the Vice Admiral Albert Konetsky Submarine Squadron 15 Headquarters Building is named in your honor in Guam. and. Uh, what a tribute for all the work you've done uh, on behalf of our country. So you've got a very special honor. Gary, and now you're you. leading the effort to uh, find funding for the new Navy Museum in Washington. <laughs> and That's going to be a battle too, but we'll get there. On sure you, well, Thank the fact you, that you're, you're known as Big Al, the sailor's pal, probably says it all. So well, very you. nice. I'm honored. Thanks, Gary. Yes, yes, sir. Well, welcome on behalf of the National Maritime Historical Society and the National Coast Guard Museum Association to our 10th National Maritime Awards show as we spend the hour in a heartwarming salute to our armed forces, honoring three iconic American maritime institutions that epitomize the maritime history of the United States of America and for generations have been at the forefront of supporting the nation's maritime commerce defense and security. Now, I hate to kick it off this way, but we were saddened this year with the deaths of three uh, committee members and award recipients that have been so much part of our events over the years. So we bid farewell to Jack London, Howard Slotnick, and Charlie Robertson. So I'm just gonna take a moment and pause here. Well, thank you very much. We'll miss all three. Well, nothing like this happens without our sponsors and our gratitude to them is boundless. So please join me in thanking our Commodore sponsors, J.D. Power family, Susan Curtin, Admiral Al Konetsny, and Howard Slotnick. And with that, we'd like to thank our Admiral sponsors, Ron Oswald, the Poland Group, and Bill White. Thank you very much, all of you. And let me say we are uh, grateful to our captain sponsors listed on the screen here. Give me a second to look at it. And of course, to our individual sponsors. And then finally, to our contributor sponsors. Bravo, thank you very much. Well, we certainly owe a special debt of gratitude to our hardworking National Maritime Awards Committee, especially our co-chairs, uh, Admiral Konetsny and Denise Kreb, 
and our founding chair, Phil Webster, who some of us heard from a little bit earlier. Now, a little tradition here with our, our tense award in, in Washington, even though we're virtual, uh, no maritime event would be out, would be complete without a little sailing footage. So I have a, a few two minute clip here of the America's Cup races that just completed down in Auckland, New Zealand. And I don't have a script here, so we're on ESPN and I'm just narrating it live. So I hope you enjoy this. And it's hard to believe how much money has been spent in the quest to get this America's Cup for sure. The races were in Auckland, New Zealand, which the moniker is the city of sales. And it came down to Italy versus New Zealand. We joined the boats in race nine as they head downwind, sailing at 36 knots. These boats could sail almost four times the speed of the wind. And in this race, uh, Italy did a good job holding New Zealand outside the uh, turning marks. You've got to go inside the mark before going upwind. And at this point, New Zealand is up five to three. So the Italians, Luna Rosa, really need a good victory right here. And as you can see, they've got about a 10 boat length lead. But New Zealand started catching up and this was the key moment. So Italy, right out of classic match racing, tax the cover, but they forced New Zealand to the right side of the course. And as luck would have it, the wind shifted 20 degrees to the right. The wind died a little bit. New Zealand skipper Peter Burling took advantage of the wind shift and the puff. And as you can see, he got a 190 meter lead. And this would put New Zealand up with a uh, commanding six to three score. So the first boat to win seven gets the cup. And here we are in race 10. Italy on the left looks like maybe a little bit better start coming off the line. And as they start, look at that, 30, 33 nautical miles per hour in a monohull sailboat with foils. But New Zealand, a little bit faster, leads at the winter mark, no opportunity for the Italians to catch up. And a happy day in the city of sales when New Zealand uh, successfully defends the America's Cup. New York Yacht Club was in it. I was sad that American Magic uh, didn't make the cut, but maybe uh, they'll get their team back together and we should know in a couple months whether New York Yacht Club will be uh, competing for the America's Cup next time. So anyway, that's my brief two minute overview. You didn't have to watch uh, three months of coverage at midnight, you can see it right there. So. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, well, with that, uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tim Runyon, Chairman of the National Maritime Alliance, whose unstinting efforts in Washington for federal funds for the maritime heritage community have helped us underwrite millions of dollars of projects. Tim, good evening and welcome. Thank you, Gary. I hope everybody can hear me. And I am uh, delighted to be here and I wish we were in person because I am gonna speak about advocacy and the National Maritime Awards Dinner is a wonderful opportunity for that as we've had many members of Congress attend our dinners and that's where we get an opportunity to communicate to them exactly what the needs of the maritime heritage community are. Our principal goal at present is to secure funding for the Federal National Maritime Heritage Act grant program, which was established way back in the 1990s. And it provides funding for education and preservation grants. And it's a competitive program requiring a one-to-one -one match. It's not a free lunch. And nonprofits, tribal, state, and local governments are eligible to apply. Now the grant program has yielded since its first grant cycle in 1998, only about a little less than $10 million. And that's really not sufficient for our needs. It's been an unreliable and inadequate source. It comes from a percentage of the scrapping of ships in our so-called mothball fleet by the Maritime Administration. So we're working on a federal appropriation of $10 million in this current budget cycle. And we're led by Again, Representative Brian Higgins of New York, who has been our champion in this cause, who recently teamed with Representative Greg Murphy of North Carolina in a bipartisan effort 
to secure this $10 million in funding. The hope is that the grants will restart again for this critical period when in fact, uh, funding is desperately needed primarily due to the COVID crisis and how that's affected attendance-based maritime museums and other organizations. Grants have kept vessels afloat in the past through this program. They funded historic vessels like USS Olympia in Philadelphia, Star of India in San Diego, Sabino at Mystic Seaport, the Coast Guard Cutter Taney, we've already heard about Taney, but this is a different Taney, in Baltimore, the John W. Brown as well, Liberty Ship, Constitution Museum, uh, historic lighthouses from Split Rock, right behind me, painted by my mother-in-law, lighthouse in Minnesota to Pigeon Point in California, uh, maritime museum, sail training programs, underwater archaeology projects, even the conservation of artifacts here in North Carolina off of Blackbeard Shipwreck, the Queen Anne's Revenge. Arg. <laughs> well, remember, those old World War II posters they used to say, when Uncle Sam pointed his finger, we need you. Well, I'm doing that, but I'm not Uncle Sam. I'm just a university professor. And we know how to make students do things sometimes with different means than Uncle Sam. But I need you to write to your members of Congress to get them to help secure funding for the National Maritime Heritage Grants Program. So write to your members in the House and the Senate. They got to hear from constituents, not from me. Join us in this effort. And don't allow COVID to defeat our aspirations. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, your message is noted. We'll get the uh, paper and ink out and start writing to our Congress people. Thank you. Well, now I'd like to introduce to everybody our National Maritime Historical Society Chairman, Ron Oswald, who spearheads the society's involvement in National History Day. The purpose is to get students excited about studying Maritime history, something that we're all passionate about. And Ron is a true representative of the maritime heritage community. And I learned recently, Ron, that you are a member of 40, count them, 40 maritime organizations. Welcome. That's a lot. Well, thank you, Gary, for those kind words of introduction. And uh, let me also thank Tim Runyon for uh, he's done in advocating for the maritime heritage. Um, I'd also like to um, welcome everyone who is joining us this evening as we honor those whose accomplishments exemplify the very best of America's maritime heritage. The National Maritime Historical Society was founded in 1963 and has continually worked to educate all Americans about the importance of the sea and seafaring to the country. Our publication, Sea History Magazine, from humble beginnings in 1972 to become the cornerstone of the society's educational efforts. The society's website, seahistory.org, offers an invaluable great resource with every now with every issue of Sea History indexed and accessible online. The website also provides updated information about the activities in the maritime heritage community. And we are proud to serve as the voice of that community. We sponsor and support maritime events, lectures, and conferences. We promote the preservation of historic vessels and advocate for maritime organizations across the country. In a major effort aimed at young people, as Gary has pointed out, National Maritime Historical Society proudly participates in National History Day. We do that by offering prizes for maritime projects excellence. This program is one that's voluntary and it's aimed at middle and high school students. And this year, 
thanks to the Maritime Heritage Grant funding that Tim Runyon spoke about just a few minutes ago, we're cataloging our maritime library, making it accessible to researchers and the public. Let's take a look at some of the work we do in this brief video, which is narrated by our trustee, Admiral Robert J. Pack, Jr., the 24th Commandant of the United States Coast Guard. Since its beginning in 1963, the National Maritime Historical Society has been celebrating the sea, raising awareness of our maritime heritage and the role seafaring has played in shaping civilization. In the pages of Sea History magazine, thousands of readers have discovered a treasure trove of tales, past and present, that captivate, inspire, and educate us about the vital role of the sea and those who have sailed upon it. Our seafaring legacy teaches us timeless lessons of courage and respect, teamwork and self-reliance, resourcefulness and grit. And now it's even more important than ever to bring these lessons to the next generation, tomorrow's maritime leaders. Thank you to all the supporters of the National Maritime Historical Society for your generous and steadfast support of our mission. None of our accomplishments would be possible without the dedication and generosity of people just like you seeking to raise awareness of our seafaring past and how that heritage continues to shape our country. Nice, very nice. Admiral Papp always does such a great job with his narration and speaking. Well, we now look in on Captain Wes Pulver, president of the National Coast Guard Museum Association following 28 years of distinguished <laughs> service to the U.S. Coast Guard. His final cutter was the U.S. Coast Guard Bark Eagle, which has got the great moniker, America's Tall Ship. He was commanding officer from July 2012 to July 2015. Now that is a good job. Captain Pulver. Thank you, Gary, for the introduction. And that was a good job. <laughs> um, on behalf of the entire National Coast Guard Museum Association board and our team, and as a Coast Guard objective, uh, the senior officer in charge of our project, Admiral Charles Ray, the Vice Commander of the Coast Guard, who is with us tonight. Um, I am extremely excited about uh, putting a film up in front of this group tonight. Our mission at the Coast Guard Museum Association is to build our nation's first National Coast Guard Museum. It's a simple but very challenging goal. Um, and we're gonna make a museum worthy of all those who have served. I'm very excited um, to pass to this group today that we have exceeded our 50% fundraising goal. Our goals of $150 million were exceeded last year. We're at 76 million and our momentum is strong right now. Um, coming out of the pandemic, we've had a lot of people come to us and say, hey, they're interested. So I'm hoping we all see that uptick um, this evening. And honestly, we're ready to get to construction. So we'll keep you all informed. Um, this evening, I'm very pleased to introduce a film that reinforces the need for a Coast Guard Museum. It features Lieutenant Commander Lysandra Holmes. She is the first Coast Guard's first female African-American helicopter pilot, which proves to all of us the Coast Guard men and women are making history every day. I'd love you to run the video. Throughout our history, the Coast Guard has changed. Our cutters, our people, our name. But through it all, what has remained are the traits found in every Coast Guardsman and woman. Traits of honor, respect, devotion to duty. And though we're separated by time, we are united by a purpose. To do whatever it takes to help those in need. And we carry on that legacy. A legacy of all those who came before us. And a legacy that will continue 
long after we're gone. Because we make history every single day. Is powerful. Whew, I'm recovering. <laughs> so I bet you are too. Well, now we're in the most interactive part of the evening with our friend Drew Forster, Director of Communications of the National Coast Guard Museum Association. And he acts as a liaison to the Coast Guard team developing exhibits for the future museum. And Drew, will you tell us about how our guests this evening can support the efforts? Absolutely. Well, first of all, typically you would have had to buy a ticket for this event. If we were doing it as we usually do at the press club, you got to come for free. And so that means that we hope that you will be generous in supporting these great causes. Tonight, we are proud to partner with the National Maritime Historical Society and hope you will be able to support the work that we do. Every donor plays an important role in preserving and promoting our shared maritime heritage. Your support advances the ability of both of our organizations to bring the stories of our maritime heritage to new audiences. Tonight, we ask you to help us open doors. Let's open the door to increased federal funding for the maritime heritage community. As you just heard from Dr. Runyon in a tux and with props with his graduation cap on, we, needed, we need to increase our efforts to advocate for the critical funding of all maritime institutions. That means hiring staff and organizing volunteers, communicating with the public, writing to legislators, and thank you, Ms. Antoine, there will be a template available at seahistory.org so you can write those letters, and then knocking on doors of those same legislators, conducting research, and mobilizing for our cause. With your support tonight, the National Maritime Historical Society will be able to fund so much more work this year. And it is particularly important to build a national museum to celebrate centuries of Coast Guard service to the country. Once built in Connecticut's Coast Guard City, New London, the National Coast Guard Museum will educate, engage, and inspire visitors, showing how the men and women of the service have dedicated themselves to our nation since 1790 and how they have tirelessly answered the call of duty, saving lives, enforcing maritime law, defending our nation, facilitating commerce, and protecting the environment. Your support gets us closer to the day when we can open our doors. So to open doors, we need you to raise your hand. And we wanna give everyone here the opportunity to support our work in whatever capacity is right for you. And because we're on Zoom, you can raise a digital hand. And if you've never done this before, that's how you do it, Alt-Y. If we say a dollar amount that you're willing to contribute at, you hit Alt-Y. If you're on a Mac, that's gonna be Option-Y. So uh, that's how you would raise your digital hand. We are looking to raise $25,000 tonight. If you're on a, uh, on a mobile device, you can tap in the bottom right corner of your screen and, and raise your hand. If all else fails, just raise your hand the old fashioned way. We have <laughs> spotters will be looking out for you. So we're looking to raise $25,000 to promote our maritime heritage. And so we are starting the giving high at $10,000. Do we have a generous person on this Zoom tonight who's ready to promote our maritime heritage with a gift of $10,000? Another way you can do this is to type your name and a contribution amount in the chat at the bottom of the screen. And if all else fails, like I said, wave a real hand in the air and our spotters will locate you and confirm your contribution amount. Anyone at the $10,000 level to help us meet our goal. Well, we have a lot of important things to get onto, so let's go to $5,000. Is there anyone who is willing to give a gift of $5,000 tonight to support and promote our maritime heritage? Oh, I see Ed Malloy. And I see Walter Brown raising his hand. And Bill White. 
over and above your sponsorship, Mr. White. Thank you so much for that gift. That is incredible. So we have three gifts at the $5,000 level at this point, Admiral Loy and Mr. White and Mr. Brown. Is there anyone else at the $5,000 level? Okay, moving on to the $2,500 level. Is there anyone who's willing to give $2,500 to help to preserve and promote our shared maritime heritage? Mr. Weirick. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Jeremy, thank you so much for giving at the $2,500 level. That's incredibly generous. Do Is there I anyone else? Brown? I see Walter Brown raising his hand. I think he came in at $5,000, Bertie. No, he's, I think, can we, can you unmute him? Walter, unmute yourself. Oh, we're waiting for Walter. Is there anyone else who's willing to give $2,500 to preserve and promote our shared maritime heritage? Well, we will, we will figure out where Walter wants to be in his, uh, in his general. So Walt, Walter gave the $5,000 for Howard Slotnick. So now he's giving the $2,500 for himself. Wonderful. So uh, that was uh, on behalf of Sharon, I think. I think yes. she was on earlier and had to go. Yes, it's her birthday. So <laughs> she went off to celebrate and Walter agreed to raise his hand for Howard. Well, that is wonderful that uh, Howard's legacy uh, lives on and, uh, and we do appreciate that gift. And Mr. Brown, we appreciate you giving uh, on top of that your own $2,500. That is wonderful. Last call at $2,500. Thank you so much. Moving on to the $1,000 level. Is there someone tonight who'll raise their hand and say, I want to give $1,000 to preserve and promote our maritime heritage? Drew, I see, that Oswald, I see that hand. Yes, thank you. I see Ron Oswald's hand. And also I see that Deborah Antoine has given us a thumbs up for $1,000. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much, Ms. Antoine. Thank you so much. And there's another digital hand, Chip Loomis and Jean oh. Wart. Thank you so much for giving a thousand dollars. Again, that's Alt Y. If you want to raise your hand, my prop Drew, is upside down. Drew, I also see uh, Phil Webster and Ermy waving their hand in the screen. <laughs> I think maybe we should confirm that that's for a thousand dollars. If that's the case, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Ermy. Thank you so much. That is over and above all of the great work that the Websters have done to, uh, to support um, this mission of preserving and promoting our maritime heritage. Is there anyone else at the $1,000 level? Again, you can type a giving amount in the chat if you'd like. All right, moving on. If you had to fly to DC, this is getting into the range of what you would have spent to uh, come down and, and spend a, a couple of nights in DC for this event, $500. Is there someone who'll give $500 to preserve and promote our maritime heritage through these wonderful organizations? It's always great when you can acknowledge the boss, Captain Wes Pulver, thank you very much. William Green, we appreciate you. Mr. William Dudley, always there for us. Gary Jobson, for everything you do for the maritime community and for that generous gift of $500. We appreciate you. Thank you very much. We see Dick Michaud, is that how you pronounce it? And uh, uh, I saw Rick Scarano and Karen Helmerson. Thank you very much. I also see a yeah. uh, digital hand raise, Samuel Byers. Thank you so much, Mr. Byers. Mr. Gilmore, I see that hand, 66. Dr. Timothy Runyon, maybe he's taking the tux off. He's turned off his camera, but he's still giving <laughs> to the cause. We appreciate that so much. Is there anyone else at the $500 level? Well, I have been trying to tabulate uh, as we've been going, uh, but I'm also watching the clock. And uh, this is coming to the end of our 
uh, time allotted for this portion of the program. If you would like to give, Perchie, uh, am, did, am did you see um, Eric Nielsen, Captain Nielsen from the Baltimore Pilots? He's got his I hand up. Did, did not see that hand. Thank you so much for your gift. Also, Drew, uh, Captain, pa Captain Patrick Burns has donated $500. He posted that in the chat. Thank you, Captain Burns. That's wonderful. Well, this is a testament to the way this community values these causes. Every dollar counts and helps us toward our goal. If you didn't get a chance to contribute just now, you can always visit us online at seahistory.org slash donate. And that will be in the chat as well. It's already there. So thank you all so much for your generosity this evening. We might be able to come back in with, a, with an update because we weren't able to tabulate exactly in real time, but it seems to me like we came very close if, if we didn't reach that goal to further the advocacy work that helps all our maritime heritage institutions. Back to you, Mr. Jobson. And Drew, uh, I'm sorry, if I could just interrupt for one moment. It looks like we have raised $32,000 this evening. So thank you all for your incredible generosity. Well, that's that is incredible and very close to what we raised at our last in-person event. And so that is a testament to how this group uh, comes forward and supports the cause uh, even through the toughest times. Well, that's pretty impressive to shoot for 25,000 and up at 32 and maybe we'll get a few more uh, through, through the rest of the night. Well, thanks Drew and thanks everybody for your generous support. And now I know we're all excited to meet our award recipients. And first, a little film here to honor the Coast Guard Aviation Association. So let's go to the film. Our association originally hatched as the Ancient Order of the Pterodactyl is a volunteer organization of over 2,000 aviators and enthusiasts who contribute extraordinary amounts of time, talent, and resources to support Coast Guard aviation. Since its founding in 1977, the pterodactyls have raised and donated over $1 million to assist families in distress, finance air crew awards and scholarships, fund memorials to fallen guardians, mentor Aviation Command cadre, and sponsor social events that celebrate our heritage and promote camaraderie among aviators and their shipmates. We are also recognized as a formidable historical society for documenting and preserving the 105 year history of Coast Guard aviation. We've logged hundreds of volunteer hours in the historian's office at Coast Guard headquarters. One of our greatest contributions was the restoration of a retired HH-52 Alpha airframe to museum quality and arranging for its display in the Smithsonian Museum. In total, Taros have provided 22 aircraft and support funding at 13 other aviation museums around the country, enabling millions of visitors to see and learn about the Coast Guard. In the recent past, the Taros were instrumental in honoring Captain Frank A. Erickson, U.S. Coast Guard retired, Coast Guard helicopter pilot number one with a posthumous Legion of Merit medal that was presented to his family for his legacy and contributions to the nation. Captain Erickson pioneered the use of the helicopter as a rescue device He's one of the most influential reasons that the helicopter is what it is today, not just for the Coast Guard, but for all branches of our military and others around the globe. Taros also purchased a prestigious and very appropriate new headstone for the Frank Erickson gravesite in Galveston, Texas, and conducted an appropriate ceremony and reception for the attendees from Coast Guard Air Station Houston, Coast Guard Headquarters, and the Aviation Association. The Taros highlighted the 100th anniversary of the Coast Guard Air Station at Moorhead City, North Carolina, and prompted a pair of Coasties to snap a photo of the site 
where flight operations began on March 24th, 1920. Our historian Emeritus published a fantastic article and blogs to capture the moment. Where we go begins with where we came from. We commemorated the centennial anniversary of the first airborne transatlantic crossing of the NC-4 piloted by First Lieutenant Elmer Archie Stone, Coast Guard Aviator No. 1, during a public ceremony on the seaplane ramp at the former Rockaway New York Coast Guard Lifeboat Station. We recognize the graduation of helicopter rescue swimmer number 1000, AST-3 Keegan O'Leary from ASTA School. This momentous achievement crowns the now 35-year history of the helicopter rescue swimmer program in Coast Guard aviation. The Taros have championed the Coast Guard cutter Elmer Stone, Wimsel 758, a legend class national security cutter presenting ceremonial gifts and morale funds to the crew of this Coast Guard Aviation namesake cutter. Terra's attended the christening and commissioning ceremonies and noted crew accomplishments in our Terrogram newsletter. In keeping history alive, CGAA contracted to have a near life-size bronze bust of Lieutenant Jack Riddisher, artfully done by a famous sculptor for presentation to the Coast Guard Museum in New London, Connecticut. Lieutenant Riddisher, Aviator 997, served as a volunteer instructor and duty standing combat helo pilot with the U.S. Air Force Air Rescue Service and was the only Coast Guard aviator killed during the Vietnam War in the performance of duty during a heroic but difficult combat rescue of a downed aviator. The Taros conduct conventions annually called Roost to enable members to network, share memories and experiences among different generations and provide context to present day Coast Guard aviation operations. We are proud to contribute and honored to receive this award. As we look at the credits here, I just have to comment about how far aviation has come over the last hundred years. And uh, you got to realize every one of those craft were at the leading edge of technology during the time they were in service. So I see Admiral James Lloyd, the 21st Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard is ready to present the National Coast Guard Museum Association's Alexander Hamilton Award to Captain Michael Emerson for the Coast Guard Aviation Association. Admiral Lloyd, welcome. Mary, thank you so very much. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to show the video and let the audience catch up a little bit on Coast Guard aviation history. It's my pleasure on behalf of the board chair, Susan Curtin, and the entire Coast Guard Museum Association uh, to present the Alexander Hamilton Award to the Coast Guard Aviation Association. This award represents the highest honor bestowed by our organization. It's named for Alexander Hamilton, the founder of the Revenue Cutter Service in 1790 a forerunner service to the modern day Coast Guard. We're proud to recognize the Coast Guard Aviation Association, not only for their support of the museum, but for their continued dedication, as you heard on the video, to preserve Coast Guard aviation history, support science and aviation education, and recognize the devoted Coast Guard air crews who day in and day out are risking their lives time and time again in service to our fellow citizens in our, in our nation. As we heard on the video, the pterodactyls now number about 2,000 members. It's always comprised of active duty officers and enlisted aviators, retired and former air crews, and just aviation enthusiasts. One of the things I'd point out is that uh, the aircraft that you saw uh, being preserved, uh, a museum quality restoration, as we all know, was that HH-52 Alpha that now hangs proudly from the rafters at the udvar Housie Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. I was there that day when we hung the aircraft from the, from the rafters and it had a very special meaning for me because that was the very aircraft involved in an extraordinary rescue from the decks of the Coast Guard Cutter Valiant back in 1979, of which I happened to be at the time the commanding officer. So I know that story very, very well wherein they, they literally lifted over 30 people 
from the decks of the burning uh, tanker Burma Agate, which had been uh, in a collision in the, uh, in the ship channel leading into Galveston, Texas. Extraordinary day where aviators proved their mettle once again uh, for their opportunity to respond immediately to those in need on the sea uh, and doing uh, extraordinary things uh, day in and day out. Captain Mike Emerson is the current president of the Pterodactyls, the Coast Guard Aviation Association. And I wish I could, Mike, I wish I could be presenting this to you in person, but by the magic of electronic wizardry, we think you already have the plaque in hand. And I thank you and all of the members of your association for your terrific support for the National Coast Guard Museum. Thank you, Gary. And thank you very much, Admiral. And well, now over to you, Captain Emerson. And thank you very much, Admiral. That was fantastic. Uh, thanks to the National Coast Guard Museum Association and to the National Maritime Historical Society. Indeed, I do have the plaque and I'm privileged to accept this stunning Alexander Hamilton trophy. This is incredible. I carried this 20 pound beauty in my helmet bag all the way to Nome, Alaska. And it was especially popular with the TSA at each of the security screenings. It's very heavy. <laughs> I am joined today uh, by a number of pterodactyls, including the key members of our executive board. My vice president, Giannis Nagy, the secretary, Mark DeAndrea, treasurer, Mike Brandhuber, and our executive director, uh, Ben Stoppe. Uh, they have helped to drive all of our programs, uh, our recognitions and awards for aircrew accomplishments, the memorials for fallen guardians that were mentioned, uh, our mentoring programs, our aviation unit coordinators that we set up, uh, of course, sponsoring all kinds of social activities, and most notably, the Preserving History programs. Uh, we really take great pride in those preserving not only aviation history, but Coast Guard history. The Coast Guard Aviation Association is deeply proud to support a national museum that honors our extraordinary heritage and our shipmates. So thank you very much. This is a huge honor and we're proud to be part of the program today. Thank you. Well done. I, I bet that was a challenge carrying a 20 pound uh, award around through TSC. Anyway, thanks for doing that and congratulations. Well, now it's our honor to pay tribute to the United States Merchant Marine. So let's go to our next film. Flag of the Merchant Marine reads in peace and war which reflects the dual nature of our nation's merchant marine. It provides ships and highly trained men and women who help support and power an economy during times of peace and serve in a supporting role in times of conflict and war as a naval auxiliary, transporting troops and materiel. On October 13th, 1775, months before the nation declared its independence, the Second Continental Congress authorized the creation of the Continental Navy. Constructing warships would take too much time. In order to create an immediate force, Congress initially looked to the commercial docks of Philadelphia. American merchant ships and their mariners adopted the banner of the Continental Navy. Vessels of all types were transformed into warships. Seamen became sailors, and the American Merchant Marine was born. Americans think of shipping as an oceanic enterprise, as indeed it was during the colonial period. But for most of U.S. history, shipping on coastal and inland waters has exceeded oceanic shipping in both volume and value. America is a brown water nation with a blue water consciousness. Beginning early in the 19th century, Americans began trading more with themselves than they did with the rest of the world. And all of this shipping was protected from foreign competition by cabotage laws adopted early in the Republic, excluding foreign vessels from shipping between American ports. The Merchant Marine Act of 1920, also known as the Jones Act, established the relationship between the merchant marine and the military, designed to ensure the operation of American ships on international routes and provide protection for the coastal trade. The subsequent Merchant Marine Act of 1936 provided for the national defense that the United States shall have a merchant marine of the best equipped and most suitable types of vessels sufficient to carry the greater portion of its commerce 
and serve as a naval or military auxiliary in time of war or national emergency. The heart of maritime enterprise is and always has been commercial shipping. The transport of passengers and goods from port to port by water. Today, this comprises a vast web of activities and infrastructure. Ships entering and leaving American ports require aids to navigation, resupply of fuel, food, and water, local pilots and agents, shore workers to load and unload, admiralty lawyers, insurers, and more. Intermodal cargo passes seamlessly between ships, trucks, railroads, and even airplanes. Petroleum often flows directly from ship to pipeline at offshore platforms. Mega ships, a quarter of a mile long and unload their cargo in hours, not days, contributing to just-in-time inventory systems have become a hallmark of the globalized economy. During World War II, the fleet was nationalized. The U.S. government determined the cargo and the destinations, contracted with private companies to operate the ships and put guns and naval armed guards on board. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt called the U.S. Merchant Marine the fourth arm of our national defense. The U.S. Merchant Mariners carried soldiers, vehicles, fuel, and supplies during the war and suffered the highest rate of proportional casualties of any of the armed services over the course of the war. During the Korean War, commercial ships transporting 5 million troops and passengers, 54 million tons of cargo, and 180 million barrels of fuel. In Vietnam, U.S. merchant ships completed nearly 7,000 sea lift transits and evacuated over 130,000 refugees at the war's end. And the U.S. Merchant Marine played a major role in the Persian Gulf War, helping to execute the largest, fastest, and farthest sea lift to a single theater in world history. During its history, the United States moved from the ships, barks, and pinasses that brought Europeans to North America in the age of discovery to the megaships that sail the world's oceans today. The Merchant Marine has played a critical role in American history. Its story is one of risk, determination, and innovation, for shipping constantly changes its stripes. Today, the United States is the world's largest trading nation. 95% of the cargo tonnage that enters and leaves the United States comes and goes by ship. The mainstays of the U.S. economy continue to move by water. At one time, the maritime trades were, after agriculture, the second largest employer of American labor and remains an indispensable component of the world's largest economy. Today, the U.S. Merchant Marine is made up of American civilian mariners and the fleet of U.S. civilian and federally owned merchant vessels. The commercial fleet includes privately owned ocean-going and self-propelled vessels that carry cargo from port to port as well as passengers. U.S. Merchant Marine officers are more important than ever to our economy, vital to our national security, highly trained and committed to serve. The U.S. Merchant Marine, in peace and war. Inspiring to say the least. It's amazing how much cargo gets shipped, 95% by the sea. So tonight presenting the award is our dinner co-chair, Denise Krepp, a leading advocate for funding for the heritage. Denise, by the way, has served on active duty as a Coast Guard JAG officer. And after 9-11, she helped create the Net Transportation Security Administration. She's also worked for the House of Representatives Homeland Security Committee and served as the Maritime Administration Chief Counsel during the first Obama administration. Tonight, Denise has the honor of presenting the National Maritime Historical Society's Distinguished Service Award to Lucinda Leslie, Acting Administrator of the Maritime Administration. Denise, welcome. Thank you. And I want to say welcome to everybody. This is a family um, event. We're all coming together. It's so cool for me to see my Coast Guard friends and my Navy friends and my Merchant Marine friends and my sailing friends, by the way, that's you, Gary. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we just saw an amazing video that was uh, read by Sal Mercagliano. 
And Sal is a professor at Campbell University. And he shared that for 245 years, the Merchant Marine has been an integral part of our country. 245 years. Now I'm gonna share a little sea story that I didn't tell Birchie about. When I was in Edinburgh uh, a couple of years ago, we went and looked at the castle and we went to the very bottom and I looked and I was like, I think that's an American flag that was etched. What is an American flag doing in a castle in Edinburgh, Scotland? Well, it was merchant mariners that were seized during the battle of 1812. So, you know, we've had merchant mariners that have been prisoners of war. We've had merchant mariners that have made sure that our cargo uh, arrives. We've had merchant mariners in Murmansk. We've had merchant mariners in the Persian Gulf. We've had them everywhere. They've been our mothers, our fathers, our sisters, our, our, our brothers, our uncles, our grandfathers. And we know people because that's part of our country. We are a maritime nation. And it, it's a maritime nation that is dependent upon our ability to go to sea. So that's why I was just absolutely thrilled for Sal to, uh, to share the story. Now, part of his story he talked about was President Roosevelt. And President Roosevelt over 75 years ago said that the Merchant Marine was the fourth arm of our national uh, defense. That was true 75 years ago and it's true today. So when you look around and you look behind you and you look and you see, hey, there's a book or there's a painting or there's a shoe. The reason you have that in your background is because of the US Merchant Mariners. So that's why I'm honored. I'm just absolutely honored as the co-chair, by the way, with the amazing Al Konetsky to be able to give the National Maritime Historical Society Distinguished Service Award to my friend, Lucinda Leslie, who is an amazing lady and who is currently serving as the acting maritime administrator. So Lucinda, thank you for receiving the award on behalf of the Merchant Marine, an amazing institution that quite frankly, we can't have enough of. So over to you, Lucinda. Hi, Denise. Thank you for having me. It is an honor to be with you. The National Maritime Historical Society, the National Coast Guard Museum Association, and the Naval Historical Foundation have always been great friends and partners to our nation's seafarers, and they've been key in helping to support and promote this great industry. Thank you for prevent creating this event and for your ongoing efforts to honor our nation's mariners who have made exceptional contributions in service to our industry and to our nation. It is a privilege to accept this award on behalf of the U.S. Merchant Marine. As you all know, America is a maritime nation. Without our coastal and inland waterways and our ports, uh, which have advanced our nation's growth at every stage of our history, we would not be what we are today. Because of this long history, it's no surprise to me that our merchant mariners, our longshoremen, our shipyard workers, and indeed, the workers in all facets of our maritime industry have carried forward with great fortitude despite the many challenges this year has presented. These men and women have answered the call to action whenever our nation has needed, and over the past year they've kept our critical supply chains moving, including supporting the movement of the personal protective equipment and medical supplies we've all needed. For this we are all grateful. Let me assure you that President Biden and Secretary Buttigieg understand how central this industry is to our economic and national security. They also understand that a robust water transportation system must be seamlessly integrated with a true multimodal system to ensure effective and efficient freight movement to and from our nation's shores. Uh, you've already heard Secretary Buttigieg, as well as the president, made clear their support for this industry, for American workers and for American companies through the Buy American Executive Order and for policies designated in that order as essential to our American maritime industry, including the Jones Act. At MARAD, we will continue to support these priorities and work hand in hand with you and with all stakeholders to keep our merchant mariners and our entire maritime industry strong and ensure that they are ready whenever we call upon them. For all of you who work in the industry, I know that you are just dedicated professionals doing your jobs and doing them in the midst of a crisis that we've never experienced before. In other words, it's just been a normal day's work with additional challenges. I wish I could single out every single one of you and thank you for what you've done. You should all be very proud because each of you within the sound of my voice has had a central role to play in earning the recognition bestowed tonight. 
I could not be prouder to serve with you, and I thank you all. I again thank Denise and everyone who's made this event possible. We offer our congratulations to the entire U.S. Merchant Marine community. And if I can tie all this together with a personal note, one of my proudest days of my life was the day I got my uh, third mate Merchant Marine license, any ocean, uh, any ocean, any gross tons from the from the Coast Guard, and on the same day I got my commission uh, as an ensign in the United States Navy. Very cool, uh, both ways around. So on that note, let's uh, take a little look at our film on the United States Naval Academy. In 1845, George Bancroft during his brief one month tenure as the Secretary of the Navy under President James Polk, established the Naval School at a 10 acre army post at Fort Severn in Annapolis, Maryland, with 50 midshipmen and seven professors. In 1850, the Naval School became the United States Naval Academy and a new curriculum went into effect requiring midshipmen to study at the Academy for four years and to train aboard ships each summer. As the American Civil War began in 1861, second and third class midshipmen and many officers on the faculty were ordered to active service. The Army took over the yard and the Academy's training ship, USS Constitution, was packed and sailed to Newport, Rhode Island. By the end of the Civil War, 400 Naval Academy graduates had served in the Union Navy and 95 had served in the Confederate Navy. 23 graduates had been killed in battle or died of wounds. In September 1865, Superintendent David Dixon Porter arrived to find the grounds in shambles after the war. Over the course of his tenure, he improved the facilities, revitalized the curriculum, and appointed naval officers to the faculty. Porter also introduced social events, dances, and sports in the week leading up to graduation. President Ulysses S. Grant attended the graduation ceremonies in 1869 and assisted his Civil War comrades in distributing the diplomas. On April 23, 1898, the Spanish-American War began. And on May 4th, just after Commodore George Dewey's victory at Manila Bay, Congress appropriated $1 million for new construction at the Academy. Architect Ernest Flagg placed the main chapel as its crown jewel on the highest elevation facing the Severn River. Also added to the grounds were a new armory, a boathouse, the new dormitory Bancroft Hall, also known as Mother Bay, and a new library with a clock tower. World War II brought swift changes in military methodology and technology. Submarine and air warfare became significant. By the end of World War II, the Academy had made some progress in reflecting the country's demographics. However, much more needed to be done in regard to minorities and to eventually admitting women. In 1949, Wesley A. Brown became the first African-American graduate. In 1966, President Lyndon Johnson assigned Manhattan Project veteran, Dr. Samuel Proctor Massey Jr. a professorship making him the institution's first African-American professor. On July 6, 1976, the Academy admitted women for the first time when the U.S. Congress authorized the admission of women to all service academies. In 1998, sea trials were introduced at the Naval Academy. The Cyber Warfare Center was established in 2009 in July 2019, Vice Admiral Sean S. Buck became the current superintendent of the U.S. Naval Academy. Our nation's Navy has grown from a fleet of sail and steam-powered ships to a high-tech fleet with nuclear-powered submarines, surface ships, and supersonic aircraft. 
To date, more than 26 graduates have served in the U.S. Congress, and more than 900 are noted scholars from a variety of academic fields, including 52 Rhodes Scholars. Distinguished graduates include two Nobel Prize winners, 54 astronauts, 73 Medal of Honor recipients, five state governors, and one U.S. president. The institution has educated tens of thousands of Navy and Marine Corps officers who have helped to defend the nation and the world for generations. Providing exceptional training for our future leaders, introducing midshipmen to a range of skills, and preparing its graduates for a life of service, the Academy has readied them to contribute as professionals in a variety of arenas, military, government, or the private sector. Wow, impressive. I must say our vice chairman, Rick Lopes, does such a fantastic job with these films. Rick, thank you very much. Can you hear the little round of applause? <laughs> very cool. And now what a pleasure to return to Admiral Konetsny, who will present the National Maritime Historical Society's Distinguished Service Award to the US Naval Academy to be accepted by let me editorialize here, probably the hardest working man in Annapolis, Maryland right now, Superintendent Admiral Sean Buck. <laughs> Admiral Konetsny? Yeah, hey, Gary, thank you so very, very much. And like everyone else has said, I see some of the, the typewritten little things on my iPhone. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful educational evening and listening to these tapes is just great stuff. Uh, in a spirit of openness, I want everybody to know that I have finished my second glass of white burgundy. Number two, <laughs> still wearing my Bermuda shorts on the bottom. If I stood up to get another glass of wine, if you saw them, I apologize. Uh, but what a wonderful, wonderful evening. I'd like to personally, if I may, thank shipmates that have uh, signed on for this wonderful event tonight. My classmates from the class of 1966 at the Naval Academy are so gracious. Uh, couple of folks out at Bohemia and the West Coast, and, and I'd really like to thank the superintendent staffs. With that said, it is truly an honor to stand in tonight, really, for the Chief of Naval Operations, Mike Gilday, who just could not be here, uh, and he sends his regrets. But to present this Distinguished Service Award to the Naval Academy, I guess really right now it's 176 years, uh, but it was supposed to be given last year at the 175-year point. And what dedicated service to our nation, as you saw in that uh, wonderful videotape. But the big piece is developing leaders to serve the country. And what a job over all of those years. I always get a little bit sometimes when I'm thinking, well, I think I probably was around for about one third of those years. With that said, I'm really fortunate in those many years of service and then going back at my entire time on active duty. I was lucky to serve at the Naval Academy on three different occasions. And I can tell you, in my mind, obviously I'm prejudiced, parochial as hell and everything else. That place is a national treasure. And its graduates truly, truly are the leaders that America has needed in the past and certainly needs today. So it really does give me great, great pleasure, even though I'm a stand-in probably the third alternate to present this award, to present the dedicated service, distinguished service award to the superintendent of the Naval Academy, Vice Admiral Sean Buck. I know darn well that Gary says it better than I do, but I know from what he's done, from talking to friends and other graduates, that he has so professionally led this inst institution through this terrible, terrible pandemic pandemic and he hasn't lost a beat and so if i may vice admiral buck and your wonderful staff out there have been so helpful it's an honor to present this award to you and i know that your writer gave it to you because we have your photograph well i'll turn it over to you admiral buck thank you sir and congratulations to you the naval academy and all the graduates over all of these years good evening everybody Al, thanks for, uh, thanks for the very nice words. I appreciate it. Uh, it's been a, a team effort 
to do everything that you just stated that we've been able to accomplish over the last 15 months during the pandemic. Uh, my greetings to Admiral Loy, uh, an old friend while he was in uniform with the Coast Guard. Uh, Admiral Ray, another good friend in the Coast Guard and Admiral Papp, great to see all the senior leadership past uh, of the United States Coast Guard. Gary, thanks for uh, hosting tonight. Great to see you, sir. And I look forward to seeing you a lot here in Annapolis as soon as we can and open up the yard. To all the members of the Maritime Historical Society and to all of my fellow members of the maritime community, good evening. Uh, I'd like to say thank you uh, on behalf of the entire United States Naval Academy, uh, the Brigade of Midshipmen, uh, all of my senior leadership here at the Academy, faculty, the staff, coaches, and all of our alumni who contribute so much to make this great institution what it is for our country. I'd like to express my, my appreciation and gratitude to the Maritime Historical Society for recognizing us with this award. Uh, we're very grateful for it and we'll be very, very proud to talk about it and display it here on the yard. This past year, as, as Al just said, the Naval Academy spent the year celebrating our 175th anniversary, 175 years of leadership, service, and tradition. I'm honored to be its a 63rd superintendent. Uh, despite the, the times that we've had, I'm very honored and proud to continue to keep it accomplishing its mission and keeping it open and developing leaders of character for our nation, for the future, for both the Marine Corps uh, and the Navy. As you all well know, the United States Naval Academy's come a long way. You just saw it in those pictures in that video. We've come a long way as an institution in 175 years in terms of size and scope of our curriculum. We now have 4,500 midshipmen and 600 faculty. However, one of the developments we're most proud of is our efforts to become a more diverse and inclusive institution that better reflects the citizens of our great country and our communities that's the exact people that these young men and women are gonna lead out in the Marine Corps and the Navy when they graduate. Today, the Academy provides midshipmen with state-of-the-art academic and professional training that they need to have to be effectual and winning leaders out in the fleet. Under the guidance of our world-class faculty and staff, teaching and mentoring in world-class facilities, midshipmen are now studying subjects such as cybersecurity, seamanship and navigation, naval engineering, naval weapons, leadership, ethics, military law, and of course, small arms and drill. At the United States Naval Academy, we know through decades of experience that the qualities of competence, character, and compassion can be taught. They're instilled through repetition and practice until they become part of every single midshipman's core and makeup. This is why we've expanded our experiential leadership opportunities over the four year journey of a midshipman so that they may be practice and learn leadership under challenging conditions before they reach the fleet. And I would suggest learning that in the austere environment of the maritime domain cannot be a better environment to produce confidence, grit, resilience, and stamina. Ladies and gentlemen, as the premier maritime accession source, I guess my Coast Guard compatriots may take, uh, take exception to that. The Academy continues to provide a critical foundation for the professional and individual development of our graduates who will lead young sailors and Marines while they work together to defend our very cherished way of life and the values that we all stand for. Again, let me thank all of you all for this recognition tonight. And I will do, uh, do my best in the days to come to share it with all my colleagues who helped me accomplish the mission of the US Naval Academy, and that's to develop our midshipmen mentally, morally, and physical, no matter what comes our way. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Admiral Buck, and it's clear that the Academy is in good hands. Bravo. And now as we prepare the wrap up this evening, now don't go away, because your Maritime Heritage family wants you to know in this time of social distance, distancing, good name for a boat, by the way, social distance, that we're still here for you. And to best express it, we are pleased to introduce the U.S. Naval Academy Riveters. They're named for the iconic Rosie the Riveter of World War II, 
singing a rendition of I'll Be There by Jess Glenn. When all the tears are rolling down your face And it feels like yours is the only heart to break When you come back home and all the lights are out And you're getting used to no one else being around Oh I love the way they rotated through with uh, each of them getting a solo part throughout the presentation. Beautiful. Let me thank everybody for joining us this evening. We in the United States owe a great debt to those of you in the Merchant Marine and to Lucinda Leslie, to Admiral Buck and everyone involved in the U.S. Naval Academy and to Captain Emerson and the incomparable pterodactyls. We salute you. So please go online to support the National Coast Guard Museum Association and the National Maritime Historical Society. As they say, bid high and bid often on our silent auction items. And bidding uh, is open here for a little bit. It closes at midnight on Sunday, May 16th. So we have about 10 days to go. Or find yourself an original maritime painting in our online gallery hosted by acclaimed maritime artist, Patrick O'Brien. And if you didn't get a chance to join the educational auction earlier this evening, consider contributing online. It's all on our website at seahistory.org slash Washington 2021. And with that, a real honor to be the MC tonight. And next year, I hope we see you in person. Thank you very much, everybody. Signing off.